Okay, the subject that uh, I'm supposed to talk about this morning is fear versus love. We've already talked a lot about fear versus love uh, yesterday, and it's hard really to talk about these subjects and the subject of consciousness without talking about fear versus love. Fear versus love is the theme of your existence. It's the theme of, of um, life, if you will. Okay, you, it's evolution versus de-evolution. It's good versus evil. Okay, it's low entropy versus high entropy. And this theme runs through everything. And you'll notice that all, that, well not all, but most of our literature most of our movies, most of our, our uh, even interactions with others revolves about this theme of good versus evil, low entropy versus high entropy. It's true in the, in the non-physical within consciousness as well as within this virtual reality. That's not just local to us in this physical universe, that this virtual reality. This theme is throughout all of consciousness and all of the conscious beings that are here. It is your basic reason for being here, is the low entropy versus high entropy. You come here to get rid of fear and become love. So the good versus evil theme, the fear versus love theme, is central and core to your being. And that's why it's in all of our movies and all of our literature and all of our discussions and, and at the kind of the core of the way we see the world. That is the core. And the reason for that is it's, it's the point about which the larger consciousness system evolves and de-evolves. So we're all Pete parts and pieces of the system. And it evolves and de-evolves based on good versus evil, love versus fear. So we as individuals do that, it as a system does that. That's why we have this pervasive thing, this pervasive theme going on here. So love versus fear is the core, the fundamental issue in our existence, in all reality systems. If you'd like to get a sense of how you're doing, you know, if you ask the question, well, how well am I doing on this love versus fear scale? You know, am I mostly love? Am I mostly fear? You know, where am I? Where do I have to, you know, what do I have to work on? And what's, where am I now? Look at your emotions. Your emotions are the thing that will tell you where you are in this evolutionary process. If your emotions are predominantly happy, joyful, uh, you know, life is wonderful, Every day is another opportunity, you know, to, to grow up. If you have a very positive emotions almost all the time, then you're doing very well. If, on the other hand, you experience stress, anger, upset, annoyance, you know, all the things that don't feel good, all those negative feelings. You know, if, you exp if you feel those things, maybe every day, every hour, <laughs> you know, for many people, every minute, you know, if you feel those kinds of stressful things about uh, uh, not being satisfied, not feeling, not feeling fulfilled, not, things aren't working right. 
all those negative feelings mean that you're not doing as well as you should be. That's fear. When you are fearful, you have negative feelings. So your feelings are at the being level. The being level expresses who you are at the core. So do a little self-analysis. Ask yourself, do I ever feel annoyed? Do I ever feel anxiety? Do I ever get upset? Most of us will say, yeah, 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 to all of those, most of the time, every day, we go through some of that. So that lets us know we have a lot of work to do. There's one saying uh, that deals with love that I just like to clear up a little bit because it's confusing to people, and that is, you will hear people say that you cannot love another until you first love yourself. That's confusing because I tell you that if it's love, it's about other, and if it's about yourself, it's self-centered, and that's ego. And then we have this thing about you need to love yourself, and suddenly we've got a logical problem there. So I just wanted to address that because I, I uh, hear that all the time as a question. I, you know, in my, the way I use the words, loving yourself is called narcissism. You know, I love me because I'm so neat. You know, I'm a wonderful person and deserve a lot more than I get. You know, that kind of thing is narcissism. It's about you and it's ego, and it's based on fear. Okay, now what we mean by that, you can't love yourself, I mean, you can't love others so you love yourself, really means you, you can't love others, you don't really have much to give if you don't like yourself, if you're negative about yourself. That's the problem. Being negative about yourself basically robs you of your ability to love. So that's really what that means. You can't love other people if you dislike yourself. Because if you dislike yourself, you think yourself being unworthy. You think yourself as being not good enough, incapable. And if you feel that way about yourself, what do you have to give? Well, you can't have much to give because you're unworthy. You're incapable. You're just a little bit of nothing. So there's nothing in there for you to give. So it's true. If you dislike yourself, if you have negative feelings about yourself, if you feel inadequate, if you feel insecure, that limits your ability to love. So if you have a lot of insecurity and a lot of inadequacy and a lot of negative feelings, then it's hard for you to love. And that brings us to a point of differentiating between being and acting again. Okay, when I talk about it, it limits your ability to love. It doesn't limit your ability to act loving it just limits your ability to be loving. And a lot of people get confused between the difference there. To act loving means to act kind, to act caring, to act with compassion. But if it's acting, it's out of the intellect. You're doing what you think you should. You're, being the, you're acting the way you think you should act. That won't help you grow up. You need to be kind. You need to be caring. So there's a difference between those two. Earlier I said that morality lay with intention, not with action. And you see, this is that difference. Morality has to do with how you are. It's the being. It's the intention, it's the motivation behind your choice, not your action. 
because you can act kind without being kind. Acting kind is more civilizing, makes all the people that interact with you more comfortable, they like you better, but it won't help you grow up. To grow up, you have to become kind. You have to be it, not act it, okay? So morality attaches to the intent, to the being, not necessarily to the action. I'll get a little example of that. If um, we'll just picture a little scenario where there are two people walking and the first person uh, has a money, I'll say a $20 bill falls out of their pocket on the ground and the second person sees it, okay? Now, we'll replay that two ways, but it'll be exactly the same action. The first person sees it, looks around to see if anybody's looking, and if nobody's looking, you know, they would pick it up and put it in their pocket. But because they see that there's other people around, they pick it up and they give it back to that person. They say, excuse me, you lost this, and they give it back. But they only give it back out of fear of being caught, stealing. On the other hand, we have that exact same scenario and the money falls out of the pocket and the other person immediately says, excuse me, you just lost some money. They don't look around, they don't think about it. It's not a choice of them, they're just expressing who they are. They couldn't do anything else. The idea of taking the money would never even occur to them as a possibility. You see, that's the difference. So we have exactly the same action but one of them is moral, a good choice, the, and a growing choice, and the other one is not. So that's, it's what's inside that counts, not how you act. <clears throat> so you have to, like yourself, means you have to get rid of your negativity, which means you have to get rid of your fear. So you see, it all comes back to the same thing. No matter how we look at it, growing up, being happy, having a great life, all goes back to getting rid of your fear. That's the key thing you have to do. <coughs> when you get rid of that fear, your ego goes away. Because as you get rid of that fear, it becomes less about you. Fear is always about you. When you're afraid, it's, you're afraid because of you, okay? So when you let go of that fear, you become less self-centered and more other-centered. That changes your whole reality. Remember, each of us is walking around in our own reality because of the way we interpret the world. When you feel negative, you interpret the world negatively you see a negative world. When you're positive and don't have that negativity, you see a world full of potential. Oh, still you see the problems. All the problems are still there, but that's just a bunch of people doing the best they can with what they've got, trying to grow up and actualize their potential. It's a good thing, you see. It's not that you just don't see the problems. You see them, but you see them from the, from the viewpoint of people struggling, trying to grow up and do the right thing. So your reality that you live in goes from a unhappy, painful reality to a pleasant, happy reality just by changing your personal perspective, just by getting rid of your fear. When you, when you, as you get rid of that fear, and we're gonna talk a minute about how to do that, as you get rid of that fear, it is guaranteed that your life will become more fun. It is guaranteed that your life will have better relationships, and that's relationships with everybody, with your spouse, with your significant other, 
with your children, with your boss, with your neighbors, your relationship with everybody, even with your dog and your cat. Your relationship with everything and everybody will become better, will work better. There'll be less stress and there'll be less um, uh, negativity in that relationship. You will learn to let people be who they are. Okay, when we're fearful, we want, to, we want to make sure that those awful things that we know that might happen, don't happen. Because we know the world is full of scary, unpleasant things and we know if we don't try real hard, those things will happen to us. So we want to manipulate our environment. We want to nip and manipulate people in our life, you know, the boss, the kids, the spouse, everyone. We want them to be the way we want them to be. We want them to be that, of course, because we know better how they should be. We know better what they should do. And it's really all about them, right? We're just trying to help them by helping them do the right thing, which is the thing we want them to do. You see, it gets kind of convoluted, doesn't it? Where you think it's all about other, but it's really still about yourself. Most of us spend our lives trying to make things turn out the way we want them. In other words, kind of enforcing our view of the world onto the world. We want it to be the way we want it. And that's where our energy goes. Our energy goes on, how can we make the world work better? How can I make the boss notice me and notice what a great worker I am and the great stuff I do and give me a promotion? How can I make him do that to me? What do I have to say? You know, I need to play golf with him. You know, do I need to do this or that? What, what, what's the way that I can get him to give me that promotion rather than somebody else? How can I get my spouse to do the things I want them to do? How can I get my husband to stop throwing his dirty underwear and socks on the floor? You know, how can I get my wife to do whatever it is I want her to do? How can I get the kids to behave and act the way I want them to do? We want to manipulate everybody to do the things we want. So we have a picture of life is that we try to manipulate what's going to happen so that it is more the way we want it to be. And that is nothing but frustration. That's ego, that's self-centeredness and it will cause you to be unhappy, it'll cause you to be frustrated, it'll cause you to be in a constant stress because most of the time you will fail to get it to be the way you want it. Your children are going to be your children, your significant other's going to be how they are. You, know, you have to realize everybody's doing the same thing. So here you are trying to organize your world to be the way you want it but everybody in your world is trying to organize their world to be the way they want it. And the two are not the same. Your viewpoint and their viewpoint are different. In your mind, you're right. You know the best way. It's obvious to you. Okay, so we see a bunch of people all trying to manipulate each other to do it right. That's the stress that you live with. The way that's better is that you let whatever happens, happens. You let people be however they are and then you deal with it. You deal with them, however they are, however it works out, you deal with it. And in dealing with it, you can try to be helpful. You can try to educate. You can try to say, um, you can try to tell your children about the options they have. You can 
you can tell your spouse about how you really don't like those underwear and socks, you know, on the floor. It's not that you have to not interact with things. It's just you have to not demand. You have to not manipulate. You have to let it be. Talk about the things that bother you that you don't like. Talk about the things, but talk about them not in a way of, this is what I need you to do, because this was the right way, this is the better way. Talk about it, and this is how I feel. So see, rather than talking to someone about what they should do, tell them about how you feel about what they do, and then let them deal with that, you see? That's a different way of interacting. So you just let people be, let events be the way they are, and then deal with them. How you grow up is by the quality of how you deal with them. It's those choices you make in dealing with the stuff that happens that enables you to evolve or de-evolve the quality of your consciousness. So that's what it's all about, you see. Making those choices and making them in a caring, loving, compassionate way. When you're trying to manipulate what's going on on the front end, all your choices are about how can you get so-and-so to behave like this and how can you stop this other person from behaving like that and how can you get your boss to feel this way and how can you, you know, you're constantly, you're making choices about how to get other people to do what you want. Those are not growing choices. Those aren't helping you to grow. They're all fear-based, ego-based, belief-based. You th have beliefs and you think those beliefs are truth. You see, you don't, people with beliefs don't walk around saying, well, this is my belief. They have a belief, they say, this is my truth. That's what belief is when you believe that something is a particular way. So you don't see your beliefs as beliefs, you see them as truths. But for the most part, they're beliefs, your own beliefs. And those beliefs are a projection of that fear and that ego. <clears throat> Goodness, I hear a lot of pens going. Everybody's taking notes. That's, that's good. Okay, so the fear generates the ego. If you get rid of the fear, the ego is just gone all by itself. Most of all your beliefs are also generated by your fear. You get rid of the fear, mostly the beliefs are gone. Then you're just left with the world how it is. If the world how it is disturbs you, that's also your fear and ego. If the world how it is makes you sad, well, that's not necessarily fear and ego. It could be, but it also could be love because love has a component to it that can be sad. And the sad aspect of love is when you see people who you care about, and eventually as you grow up, that people you care about gets more and more people. It's a bigger, a bigger set of people. But even if it's just your loved ones and a smaller set of people, when you see people who are doing things that are creating pain for themselves. See, most of our pain is self-created. The pain comes from our fear, for the most part. So you see people you love, and those people are constantly acting in ways, doing things, have a worldview. Their perspective is such that they're unhappy. And they're miserable, and they're in pain, but there isn't anything you can do about it. Because you can't change them. You can't change anybody but yourself. You're the only person that you can change. So here's somebody, you love them, and you see they're unhappy, and they're in pain, and it's because of the way they see the world. It's because of their fear. You can't take the fear away. You can't help them grow up. 
You have to let them be who they are, and that's sad. But when you look out and see the world in the context of, you know, it being a, a rough and rowdy and unpleasant, greedy, nasty, self-centered place, that should not make you feel unhappy. That should not make you feel angry. That should not upset you. You should accept that is the world. It's the way it is. You just accept it. Doesn't mean you like it. It just means that you accept that it is that way. That people are that way. Don't feel superior. Just think that everybody is doing the best they can with what they have to work with. What they have to work with is how much fear they've got, how much love they've got, the situation that they're in. All of that together is what they have to work with. And most everybody is doing the best they can with what they've got. So when you have that attitude, then instead of being upset that people are self-centered and rude, you have compassion for people struggling with their fear in such a way that they act rude and they're unhappy and their life is pretty much pretty miserable. So that you have compassion for those people rather than anger for them or disdain for them. So when you look out on our world, even though it's nasty, you don't see you don't see something that makes you feel negative. You feel compassion instead. Okay. So don't let the, the unpleasantness in the world make you unpleasant. Accept it as it is. Accept people as they are. And realize that everyone and everything is your teacher. Everyone is your teacher. Your children are your teachers. Your coworkers in the office are your teachers. Everyone is your teacher. Because everyone gives you opportunities to make choices. And by the way you make those choices, you get to grow up. So everybody helps you grow up by giving you choices to make. So there's somebody that you particularly don't like and they are particularly unpleasant and they say something rude to you, ah, uh -huh. that's an opportunity to grow up. You see, not, don't take that as an opportunity to get angry and get back and get even, put them in their place. That's an opportunity for you to grow up. So you look at that, and instead of feeling upset about it, you feel compassion for that person who is obviously not enjoying their life. You see, so what I'm telling you, we're talking about the fear versus love, and uh, it's basically we're coming down to a perspective. The perspective you have, the way you see reality, the way you interpret it changes your reality. So if you interpret your reality in terms of caring and compassion, then you don't see a miserable place that upsets you, makes you angry and frightened you see a bunch of people struggling and you have compassion for them and you try to help them. Okay, how do you help somebody change? I said that you can't change anybody but yourself, but you can help other people change themselves. Okay, now how do you do that? You give them an environment that makes it easier for them to change themselves. Changing yourself tends to be scary because here you are a person and you know that person and you've lived with that person your whole life, that's you, and you are comfortable. You can at least get along in life with this person. It's like, okay, I'm doing all right. Maybe not really great, but I'm making it. And if I'm gonna be different, if I'm gonna change, how is that gonna change things? Well, it is gonna change things. It changes everything. Change is scary for a lot of people. Becoming different in who you are will change everything. Changes, let's say, your relationships. So that means 
your life will be different, you'll be different. That's a little scary. So it takes people in order to do that scary thing need to feel in a safe place. So the thing that you can do for people to help them change themselves is give them, uh, help them have a safe, supportive environment. And how do you give them a safe, supportive environment? Just by caring about them, by loving them, because love is always unconditional. And when somebody feels they are loved unconditionally, they can be themselves. They can be whoever they are. And once they can be whoever they are, they have the potential to change. But if there's conditions in the relationship, you know, I'm only going to be nice to you because you're being nice to me. And as soon as I don't think you're being nice to me, I'm not going to be nice to you. Well, now that person has to be careful about how they change or what they do or that sort of thing because it's, now it's not unconditional. They've got these rules and things and they're in these conditional relationships with everybody, with their children, their spouses, their people at work, their boss. They're in these conditional relationships with everybody and they have to mind how they act, what they say, how, how they present themselves. So they start living an image rather than being authentic. So, <clears throat> being authentic is the way you become when you get rid of your fear. You become just you. So if you can help somebody else feel like they can just be whoever they are, it gives them an opportunity to change who they are because they know you'll be there and you'll care for them no matter who that is other person is that they're going to become. So it's not so scary anymore. So that's how you help other people change. And we talk about children, we're helping them grow up, particularly uh, talking about teenagers who are kind of difficult sometimes to interact with because they're in a process of separating themselves from us and becoming adults and not children anymore, which is a very scary changing process for them. You can help them most just by loving them, caring for them, and let them know that you're there for them no matter what, and by giving them choices, advice, up, um, can we say, um, helping them see a bigger picture. But what you have to not do so much, particularly with teenagers, is give them direction. When you give them direction, you're explaining to them how they should be and what they should do. Well, that's not helpful to somebody who's trying to grow to the point where they are being themselves and making their own choices, becoming an adult. So as much as you give them direction on how to be and what to do, you're kind of getting in their way of becoming themselves, discovering who they are. Really, what does it mean to be themselves? But you can give them guidance. If you see them moving toward a poor decision, rather than saying, don't do that, I forbid you to do that, don't go there, it's better to say, if you go there, here are some things that might happen. A, B, C, D, and E. And some of those things ought to be positive and some of those things ought to be negative. And it ought to be an honest assessment. You're not trying to manipulate them by giving them a lot of A, B, and C, and D. They're all scary so that they won't go. You're trying to help them make a better decision. So you give them the straight scoop on all the possibilities as you understand it from your more adult, more experienced perspective. And then let them make their choice. You see... If they make the choice, even if they make the poor choice, they will be forewarned about how that poor choice might work out. And when they begin to see it working out badly, it'll click 
real quickly, oh yeah, that's what, you know, that's what mom told me, or that's what dad told me, I can see it starting to happen, I need to back out of here. And they won't go so deep that it's hard to extract themselves because they'll have your guidance, you see. But they will have learned something important. If you just say, don't go there, they don't learn anything important other than that they aren't themselves. They can't really exercise their free will. They're still children and they have to do what they're told. That's a thing for them to accept, but it's not a growing thing for them. Now, I've just talked about children and teenagers, but the same thing applies to everybody in all your relationships. The same thing applies. Rather than tell people how to be and what to do, you can help people see bigger pictures, help them see alternatives, and then let them make the choice even if you think that's a poor choice. And if they make the poor choice, instead of telling them that that's a poor choice, because of course you know and they don't, let them find that out themselves. That then will give them an opportunity to grow up and to learn. We learn from experience. We don't learn from lectures. We don't learn from reading books. We learn from interacting. That's why it's much, <clears throat> it's much better for your growth if instead of trying to manipulate the world and all the people in it to be the way you want, you see, we learn from experiences to just have the experience, interact with the people, interact with the world how it is, make your choices based on love and caring and being helpful to others and learn your lessons as those choices give you feedback. Okay, I made these choices. The feedback tells me that those choices maybe weren't so good. Then I'll change. Not change my behavior, not change my acting, but I'll change who I am. Why I thought that was a good you know, a choice. I'll modify me so when I meet that situation again, I'll make a different choice. You see, so that's how, we, that's how we grow up. The way you get rid of a fear is to, first, you have to find it. You have to become aware of it. That's not an easy thing to do. Most of your fears are beneath your intellect's reach. <clears throat> They're things that you picked up when you were four years old. They're things that you pick up out of your culture. They're beliefs that come out of your heritage. So most of your fears are hidden. So it's hard to find your fear. But that's the first step. So how do we go about finding it? Well, we could look at the beliefs. Beliefs are derived from fear, but beliefs are just like the fear. They're very hard to find. You can't find a belief because anything you believe isn't a belief, it's a fact. That's just the way you see your beliefs, as facts. So you can't find beliefs either. Well, we're left with ego. Now there's one that's easy to spot. That's not hard to find. Ego just stands right out and waves a big red flag, here I am. You can't miss it. Ego is whenever you have a negative feeling. Okay. If you feel upset, you feel annoyed, you feel angry, that's your ego. If you didn't have that ego, you wouldn't feel that way. So whenever you have a negative feeling, you look at that feeling and say, why do I feel that way? And if you're honest, you'll end up finding your fear but sometimes it's a complicated process. You'll say, well, why do I feel that way? And your first tendency to say is, well, why do I feel angry? Well, I feel angry because she said, you know, that's why I'm angry. Susie made me angry. Sam made me angry. The dog made me angry. You know, we blame our anger on something else. 
You have to take responsibility. You choose to be angry. It's your response, right? You get to choose your response. Yeah. Susie doesn't choose your response for you. Susie just says something and you get to choose how you react to it. If you react with anger, that's because there's fear. It's because there's ego and probably belief too. So we look for those negative feelings that come up. We try to follow them back and find out what the fear is all about. So Susie said something that, she said that you just didn't do something right, that you were uh, wrong or that you made a mistake or that, uh, you know, whatever you, and Susie, however you interacted, that uh, she's not too happy with it. And it's not Susie that makes you angry, but it's because you feel inadequate inside that makes you upset. Because Susie just pushes that inadequacy button that you have. When she criticizes you, that inadequacy fear that you've got deep inside gets energized. You know, we talk about people have buttons, things that set them off, things that make them have emotional reactions. Well, Susie just pushed your feeling of, you know, fear of being inadequate button and that makes you angry, so you give it right back. You say something unpleasant to Susie. Tell her she doesn't know what she's talking about. Or point out something that she does that you don't like, or however you react to that. So find that fear. Oh, it's a fear of being inadequate. I don't like being criticized. I don't like people finding the fault. I need to be perfect. I need not to have anybody ever point out that I'm not perfect. Because if they point out that I'm not perfect, I feel that inadequacy, fear starts to resonate in me. And then it makes me angry that those people make me feel that way. You see? So you have to find your fear. Why do you get angry? Why do you feel the stress? Why does something annoy you? You'll find a fear. When you find that fear, you have to own it. You have to say, yes, I am like that. I do have a fear of inadequacy or insecurity or not being lovable or you know, not being good enough not being liked. We have all sorts of fears. The fear of being taken for granted or not being appreciated. There's lots of things that frighten us. And you have to own it and say, yeah, that's, that's me. I've got that fear. Then the next thing is you need to look through your past experience at how has that fear changed your choices? Well, just like the choice you made to get angry with Susie because she said something rude to you. She criticized you. Okay, so you have to look back and say, well, okay, that fear made me get angry and call Susie some name. You know, I called her stupid or something like that, and that was because of my fear. And go back through your last couple of weeks, last couple of years, last couple of decades of your life and see how that fear has informed your choices. And as you do this, you will begin to realize that probably 80, 90% of all your choices that you make are driven by your fear. And you'll see how it affects your life. And it won't be a pretty picture. You'll see how it's caused dysfunction in your life, how it's ruined relationships, how it strains and, and puts negativity into relationships. And that should give you the incentive to get rid of that fear. Getting rid of the fear, once you've owned it, once you've seen how it changes your world, changes your reality, 
It's just a matter of intent. You have to really want to get rid of it. Now, getting rid of a fear doesn't mean covering it over and stuffing it someplace where you can't see it. That's not what we mean by getting rid of it. You still have it if you just stuff it out of sight. Getting rid of a fear doesn't mean when Susie says something rude to you that you just smile at her and don't respond. That's a, a nicer reaction. But if that's forced out of the intellect, you see, that's not helpful either. That's acting, not being. You want to be in such a way that when Susie says that rude thing to you that criticizes you, it just doesn't make you upset at all. Matter of fact, you think, poor Susie, she's really kind of negative. I bet she has a miserable life. I wonder if there's anything I can do to help her feel better. See, you have a different viewpoint. Doesn't ring your bell, doesn't push your button because you don't have that button anymore. You got rid of that fear. All your buttons are attached to fears. Okay. So that's where we want to go. If you have this intent to get rid of it, just a serious intent, an intent you carry with you in your mind, a resolve that you have every day, and you catch yourself responding with anger, let's say as an example, every time you get that response and it starts to well up in you, you stop it, and it's not that you stuff it away, you recognize it and you say, I don't want to feel that way. I don't want to react that way. This is not helpful. It never makes anything better. It only makes things worse. It's dysfunctional. And then let it go. And that will probably happen a hundred times because it's just the way you react. And you'll continue to react that way, but you continue to catch it, continue to have that intent. I don't want to be that way. I will not react like that. We're not stuffing it away. We're trying to change who we are. That intent modifies future probability. And if you keep doing that, that fear will just dissipate. It will go away. See? It will go away. So that's how you get rid of fear. But don't pick on your biggest, meanest fear that you've got to work on it first. Pick on some fear that's kind of middling fear, you know, not such a hard fear. Because the first one is the hardest. The first time you defeat a fear and get rid of it will be the hardest thing to do and it may take you months, it may take you years, but after you do it, the second one takes half the amount of time. It's a lot easier and the third one takes half again as amount of time as the second one and it gets easier and easier to where you can, you can spot them. You can feel them coming on. You can change yourself and it gets an easier and easier thing to do. So you do need to tackle that big, ugly fear, but don't try to tackle it first. You may get too frustrated, quit the process and say, I can't do this. So pick one that's easier to work on. That's what we're here for, is to get rid of that fear. That's what makes our quality of consciousness grow. That's what makes us evolve. That's what makes us successful here. So as we do this, we become different people. And because we view things differently, instead of our buttons being pushed, giving all these negative reactions, we just smile because we're happy. And we deal with stuff, with caring, rather than dealing with negativity. Because whenever you respond with negativity, you always make the situation worse. That's a reaction that throws gasoline on a fire that's already burning. Somebody else is angry with you, then you get angry with them. That does not end up in a solution to the problem. That ends up with a worse problem than there was before. Always. You see? So when somebody pushes your buttons and you get these reactions, 
you're really making things worse. You're thinking, well, I'm not going to let them tread on me. They say things like that. When they do that to me, they're going to know they're going to get hit back. You know, I'll say something twice as rude and uh, I'll escalate it so that they won't try that again. Okay, that doesn't work that way. It makes the basic interaction worse. It makes your button more sensitive. It makes you feel bad. It leaves you in a state of anxiety. It makes you in a state of negativity. It's just bad all the way around. See, you don't have to punish other people. You have to accept them for the way they are. Help them change if you can by giving them a secure, supportive environment. You see, if somebody says something rude to you and you don't take it personally, see, taking it personally is your fear reaction, you can actually think about, well, I wonder why they have that opinion. Where does that come from? Maybe there's some misinformation they have, or maybe it's some way that I've been acting, or whatever. So you might then want to have a conversation with them. Maybe not just then, maybe later, to see where that came from. Now you have a chance of solving a problem rather than making it worse. Or you may find that person is just a person I don't want to interact with. <coughs> if that's the case, then the best thing to do is don't interact with them. Some people you can't just walk away from. They're your relatives, you know, they're your spouse, they're your children. You can't just say, wow, these people upset me, I just walk away from them, I don't want that relationship. You can't do that. You have to be there, you have to interact with, you know, Uncle Fred or whoever it is that has maybe a real caustic uh, attitude. But you have to learn to interact with them in a way that is positive. And that will help them be positive because if you say something rude to somebody, boy, you really messed that up. You know, that's the worst work I've ever seen. And they don't defend themselves. Instead, they say, oh, why? Well, tell me, you know, help me understand. The per you don't know what to do with that, you see. Uncle Fred won't know what to do when he says something sarcastic to you and you don't fuss back at him. Instead, you come over and give him a hug, ask him how he's feeling and, uh, you know, talk about it in a positive way. You're helping him now grow up because he's in this negative role where he's rude and he gets it back and it's just the way that people end up living with each other. It's a rut they get into in this attack, defense mode of living their life. And if you break that cycle just by being nice, you know, it uh, startles them. They don't know what to say after that. And it's less likely that they'll be rude to you the next time because they didn't get the reaction they were expecting. It scares them. Something's wrong here. They were supposed to be upset with me. They're not. I wonder what they know that I don't know. You know, it, uh, it helps people grow up. Okay, yeah. so let me open it up for some questions. And we'll get the mics um, over here. Uh, I have a question from yesterday that we discussed but didn't have to answer. And the question was, i pytanie wczoraj było zadane i dla Toma wydało się interesujące, żeby omówić. I pytanie dotyczy, it's about the chat room. When we are in a chat room, czyli jakby jeżeli jesteśmy, jak mówiąc o tym modelu Toma, że te jednostki świadomości, one się podłączają, logują do awatarów i pomiędzy jednym awatarem a drugim, jak ktoś powie w tej reinkarnacji, są w tej poczekalni i pytanie było, kto wybiera następnego awatara z jego potencjałem. So the question was, if, if you, the individual consciousness unit is in the chat room and waiting for another login to another avatar. Who picks up the level of difficulty of this another login of this another avatar? Okay, so that's basically a question of what happens when we die. 
What's the process? Once you, once you die, what happens next? And how do you end up then in another you know, experience? All right. Um, the part, of the part of the model I didn't talk about when I was explaining the, my model was a, a thing called a free will awareness unit. Now again, these are metaphors. Individuated unit of consciousness. They're all metaphors for functions in consciousness. Well, we have a individuated uh, unit of consciousness that's basically you, your consciousness. That's your, well, let me just go on. That free will awareness unit can partition off a piece of itself. Okay, individuated unit of consciousness partitions off a piece of itself. And it's that piece of itself that logs on to play an avatar. And that piece of itself contains all of its quality, everything it's learned, everything it has grown to become, and all of its past experiences. That quality goes into this free will awareness unit partition of itself. But none of the intellect goes there. So the things that the individual unit of consciousness knows, the facts that are in their mind, the history that's in their mind, all of the intellectual stuff in memory does not go. Just the quality, just a representation of that level of evolution that this being has attained at that time. So that goes, and that logs on to a new avatar. And it logs on in total immersion. So it's not like us when we log on to a computer game, we get tired of it, we get hungry, we have to go to the bathroom, we hit the pause button, we get up, go do something else and come back and play. That's not total immersion. Total immersion is that you're in the game, you never leave it at all. Okay, so that's why the individual unit of consciousness just puts a portion of itself, a partitioned off piece of itself in because it has other things to do and it can't be totally immersed like that. So it takes a piece, just the quality, totally immersed into a new entity, perhaps a, um, you know, an, an infant just born or maybe one that hasn't been born yet. It would start logging on whenever there was interesting data, interesting choices to be made. Okay, so once there's interesting choices to be made, then the log on takes place. So let's say in utero before birth, there's things that the, that the, that the uh, fetus can see. It sees light patterns coming and going. It knows when it's light and dark. It can hear parents. It can hear sounds of traffic. It can hear things. It can feel things. It knows it's in a liquid. It can have, you know, it can do, it can kick and push and do all those kinds of tactile things. So all of its senses can be experienced. And those experiences are interesting because remember this, this free will awareness unit that's logging on has no memory of anything, it just has quality. So it has to learn how to interpret everything just as that infant will. <clears throat> so then there's a total immersion. When there's a total immersion, it's just natural for that free will awareness unit to believe that it is the avatar because it knows nothing else. It has no memory. It doesn't remember ever being or doing any other thing. All it knows is, is that it started with light in a fluid, you know, walls to push on and then it had a birth experience and then it had this and it grows up and it learns how to interpret the data that it gets. Remember, this free will awareness unit isn't really going anywhere or doing something. It's just logged on to a data stream in a virtual reality. It's getting that data stream and reacting to it. It logs on when the data stream is interesting enough for it to want to be there and engage it to learn. 
Okay, so that's where we start with the, with the log on. Okay, now it is in that, it plays that avatar, identifies with that avatar, because it knows nothing else, thinks it is that avatar, until it eventually gets old, the avatar, because of the rule set, gets old and dies. When that avatar dies, the free will awareness unit, of course, doesn't die, it's consciousness. It's just playing that avatar. So when the avatar dies, the free will awareness unit finds itself in a different reality because it was logged on to, it was logged on to get all the data from the computer that specified that avatar's senses. Everything that avatar would have seen, heard, smelled, felt, taste, all of that is in the data stream. And it learned how to interpret it. Okay, so those are things that are that, that, uh, in consonance with the rule set. Physical biology, you know, this biological body, the biology is part of the rule set. So it gets that data. And the avatar dies, the free will awareness unit finds itself not getting that data stream from the avatar anymore. Okay, it becomes aware you know, like Dorothy, you know, there's no longer in Kansas. You know, it's no longer getting that data stream. So instead, it begins to get a data stream of what happens next. So the first thing it's aware of is that it's no longer in this virtual reality. Data in that data stream is gone. The next thing it's aware of <coughs> is that it is somewhere and, oh, look, over there. It's a spot of light. Well, maybe you wonder what that is. And then some being will come over and say, we've been waiting for you. Come on. We got your Uncle Fred and Aunt Susie are here. They want to meet you. They want to see you again. You know, they get that sort of a thing. And this is the part in, the trans, in a, what I call the transition reality, another virtual reality, another data stream, right, where you have to do a, kind of a gradual transformation because this free will awareness unit believed it was this avatar. And now it's not anymore. And you can't just make that a sudden slam of awareness. So it wants to make that pleasant, as positive as possible, a little gradual so that the, pers the free will awareness unit doesn't panic. So that's why it's often met by relatives and other things. Now, I'm just giving you kind of the general, this doesn't have to happen like this to everybody. And I'll explain a little of that later, but this is just kind of the typical experience of somebody who dies. So you get the, you get the positive introduction slowly and easily, first the spot of light, you know, and then a voice, and then to come on over here, and then, you know, maybe relatives or something else. And it's always very positive. Everything's great. And <clears throat> the next part of your transition, after you've met your relatives, they don't hang around too long, just enough to make you feel comfortable here, that this is a pleasant place, nothing's going wrong, nothing to be afraid of. And those relatives aren't really your relatives. That's the larger consciousness system playing the part of your relatives, you see, to make you feel better. But they can play it really, really well because they have all the information from those databases we talked about. So it's very convincing. Actually, it's your relatives minus their free will. That's what it is. Anyhow, then you get um, told, you know, you're matriculating in and you may be told, well, see that line over there going to this, you know, little building with the dome on top? You need to process in over there. So you go over there and you stand in line and you wait for till you get to the head of the line and they'll maybe ask you a few questions and tell you to go get in another line or whatever. And all of this is just made up to give you an opportunity to let go of what you had, your past experiences, and to get integrated positively someplace else. There's really nothing in those lines for you to do. It's all just a process to make you feel better. 
So when you first realize that you're no longer in this reality, you're no longer in the data stream from the avatar, the life that you just had begins to fade like a dream fades. Right away, immediately, it's perfectly clear. What happened, you know? Where's, you know, where am I? But very quickly, within seconds, within minutes, everything that was in that last experience packet starts to fade like a dream. Then's when you see the light and you get the people and you do this and you kind of forget about that other reality that you've just been in, you know, that's kind of gone by now unless you have an obsession with it. If you're obsessed with something in it, then it takes a little longer. So you process in until you are basically relaxed and um, not stressed about the change. And all the time, your free will awareness unit, the partition's being taken down. You're now reintegrating into the individuated unit of consciousness that is really your home, what you're part of. So you're beginning to reintegrate. And that free will awareness unit basically just disappears. It was just there, it's, it lets go. The partition is taken down and now you're part of the IUOC again. It's like that. So it's not like it gets thrown in a trash basket or something, it just disappears because the partition's taken down and now it's part of the whole thing again. And that happens slowly. So by the time you've matriculated, relaxed, saying, okay, this is, this is all right, it's not too scary, I'm good with it. By then, that boundary's taken down, you're part of your individuated unit of consciousness again, and somebody will come around and say, well, what do you want to do next? You want to get back in the game? And if you are on average, you'll say, yeah, sure. This place is boring, there's nothing going on here. And if you don't say that, they'll just let you be until you do get so bored that you want to go do something else. This is basically a boring place just to let you transition. When it's time for you then to have another experience packet or incarnation, then you will kind of have a counselor, if you will, that'll say, well, what do you think you need to, what do we want to do next time? What do you think you need to work on? Okay, in the very beginning, if you're a, just done this a few times, there's not much counseling. It's a jump in, jump out, because all you need is experience. You don't really have anything particular to work on. You don't have that much experience to know. In that case, you matriculate in, and they'll say, well, okay, we got something for you, and off you go. You say, there's not a lot of processing. But if you've been around a few times enough that you've developed some things pretty well and other things not so good, then you'll have this little counseling discussion. And you will assess yourself. And if your self-assessment is incorrect, because you think you're a wonderful, grown, you know, totally evolved, perfect person almost, and that's not actually the way it is, then you will have kind of a life review sort of session where they'll say, uh, well, maybe you ought to work on that, that anger. You know, that you just really, that last life, you have you know, terrible anger problems and the being private said, me, angry? I never get angry. What do you mean, anger problems? You know, the only times I got angry was when I should have gotten angry. Well, then they'll show you your life and they'll bring up, not the whole thing, but just those pieces where you acted very badly with your anger, you know, and they'll show you about a dozen of those, and then it's like, oh yeah, well, okay, I see, I've got an anger management problem. And that goes on until you kind of understand where you are in your evolution and what it is you need to do, and then you kind of make a plan. Okay, I need to work on that anger thing. So, what sort of situation would be good, would give me a lot of opportunities to work on that? Um, then, that kind of a situation is picked where it looks like you have a fair chance of succeeding. If you've been around a lot of times, that situation is going to be more challenging. If you're still in the beginning, it won't be so challenging. It's, you have to have a pretty good probability of success you know, in, in the incarnation that's gonna be picked for you, otherwise it won't be picked for you. 
the system doesn't want you to fail, it wants you to succeed. So you get in situations where you can succeed. Anyway, at that point, when you've decided that, then some avatar has been picked for you and your individual unit of consciousness creates a partition of itself which now represents the addition that you made to it from that last lifetime. So your input, you know, before it didn't have that, but now you've had that experience and hopefully you made a lot of great choices and your, your free will awareness unit added a lot of growth and understanding and love and now you're going to start out a little higher up on that scale than you had before. So now this partition gives that new free will awareness unit, that new piece of itself, a little higher quality to start with than it did the last time. And it goes and logs on back where we started. So that's kind of how the process goes when you die. Now, if you've been around this cycle enough times, often the meet the relatives, stand in the line is dispensed with. You don't need to do all that. You know what's going on. You remember it. You've been through it. You know, you just, uh, and you probably have a pretty good idea what you need to work on. So you're kind of more mature in the process. So you skip a lot of that and you just go have the chat. Of, well, here's, here's the problem I've been working on. So I tried this situation and that didn't work out so good last time. That just, you know, I made a lot of bad decisions there. So let's do something a little different. And you have some input to it and the system tries to match you up with something that gives you a good probability of success. So that's kind of how it works. So some people just buzz right through the process. Um, other people need a life review. Some don't. Um, some just jump in, jump out because they just need experience. But in general, that's the transition reality, another virtual reality. Remember, the only thing that's going on is that you have a, a free will awareness unit who loses its data stream with, the, with our virtual reality. It's no longer getting that data anymore. And then it starts getting data from this friendly place, which is the transition reality, as that partition is taken down and it reintegrates. Okay. Then it helps the system pick another good spot for itself and then it goes and has another experience packet. The reason we need these multiple experience packets is because growing up is a hard thing to do. Becoming love isn't easy. You need to keep working on things until you get it right. So, yes, there is a, you know, this is a test. There are good choices and bad choices, but it's never over. If you don't learn your lesson, you'll get another chance. And if you still don't learn it, you'll get another chance. And so on. You'll always get another chance to learn it. If you make poor choices and you de-evolve, then the next time you start with a little lower quality than you had the time before. Now you've dug yourself a hole and you have to work your way out of it. Maybe you'll get something a little less challenging next time or be put in a position that doesn't have the power, which often means the opportunity to, <laughs> to make poor decisions in a big way. Okay, so sometimes people ask, well, what happens to somebody who's really a horrible, horrible person? It's the same sort of thing. That horrible, horrible person is not beaten or burned or tortured or anything like that. That horrible, horrible person has to grow up. They're given something that they hopefully will do better next time. So the, the punishment they get for being a horrible, horrible purpose is the next time they start from a lower entry point, given something simpler. They gotta work their way back up. So there is no punishment other than what you provide for yourself by de-evolving rather than evolving. So even those terribly horrible people go through a similar process with counseling and life reviews and given another chance. So, and yes, um, animals are conscious. They're conscious beings. They're doing the same thing we're doing. They have a smaller decision space than us. 
we get to make a lot of choices because of being human. It gives us lots and lots of decision space. Decision space is just how many choices you have. A dog or a cat or a horse or a bumblebee doesn't have that many choices. Their choices are a much smaller set. So within that smaller set of choices, though, they're doing the same thing we're doing. They're evolving or de-evolving. So everything that has a finite decision space, everything that can make free will choices is conscious and is on an evolutionary path. And if things grow up to the point that they need more challenge, let's say you have a a horse or a dog or a monkey that uh, has grown to the point that they need a more challenging situation with a larger decision space, they may try a human avatar next time. But that's not primarily the way things move into the human uh, avatars. Primarily, uh, it's us. Um, you know, we have part of our biology is that we procreate and we have kids, and if we have kids, that's just another avatar. So the system, all those new avatars are not filled up by smart dogs and monkeys. You know, those avatars are generally filled up by the system creating another IUOC of about average uh, level of quality and letting them start then in the new, in the new avatars. But some critters can move their way up through the, you know, the bumblebee, you know, might become a chipmunk, that might become a squirrel, you know, might become a whatever until eventually it works its way up. But that's unusual, but it happens because those processes tend to be very slow. So that's kind of an answer of what happens when you die. And that's the whole cycle. And a lot of people get very upset with the idea of, I forget everything. When I die, it fades away like a dream. What about my loved ones? What about my children, you know, and my spouse and all these dear people that I have relationships with? Yes, it fades like a dream. And yes, when you go back into another avatar, you come back with no memory of any of that. The system has to work that way for multiple reasons. Imagine you have been around this cycle 10,000 times and you have had 10,000 spouses, you've got 30, 40,000 children, you know, you've got uh, probably at least five or 10,000, uh, uh, you know, best friends and so on it would be a little unmanageable after a while, you see. So you have to let that go. You're, you're here to make choices for an experience. Everybody else is going on too, so everybody else gets there, they also are going into their next experience, their next experience packet. So. They are not, they're not just sitting around waiting for you to show up so that you two can chat again. They've got the business of evolution going on and they need to get back into the game. So though you can talk to them, right, a medium, and we're going to talk to a medium uh, here uh, after I'm done, Though a medium can bring back up your Uncle Fred that's been dead for a decade, and your Uncle Fred will still be exactly the same. He'll look the same. He'll even be wearing the same clothes. No, he hasn't been in the same shirt for a decade. He, it's the image that you get represents Uncle Fred. It's coming out of a database. And it is Uncle Fred in every way that you can imagine emotionally, memory, everything, exactly that way. You can ask Uncle Fred questions, you can have dialogue, you can do it in your own mind if you, if you can, if you can't, you can do it through 
a medium, someone else. And you, uh, you can talk to Uncle Fred about current events. And Uncle Fred can say things to you. Uh, oh, that was uh, really good buying a new bicycle for you know, your grandchild. And you never said that to Uncle Fred, but he says that like Uncle Fred knows what you did last week, you see. So it's, it's very, um, it's a perfect representation of Uncle Fred, but it's out of the database. And it's typically the system doing that. And you think, well, what is the difference? Well, Uncle Fred was an IUOC. I mean, a, a free will awareness unit. It played its part, it comes back, it reintegrates, and then it's going on to the next opportunity to grow up, okay? It's not gonna hang around and say, well, I guess I'll just sit here in my rocking chair in case somebody wants to talk to me. You know, well, it's been a decade and I haven't got any calls yet, but <laughs> oh, I might, I'll just sit here for another decade. It doesn't work like that. Uncle Fred's going on. But you still can interact with Uncle Fred in every way that you could interact with him as, as when he was an avatar. With all of his memory, all of his emotions, all his feelings, everything. But it's data from a database. Remember, it's all data. There is no physical universe that you die in. There is no avatar. It's just a calculation. You are just getting data from a database. So now you're getting data about Uncle Fred when Uncle Fred was alive. Now you're getting data about Uncle Fred. Uncle Fred's been dead for a decade. It's the same thing. It's still data that you're getting that represents Uncle Fred. And that data is exactly right. The difference is that the Uncle Fred from the database is not that free will awareness unit in the sense that it's history. History is done when it's done. And how do I know that? I will just take a minute to tell you, you know, it's like, well, how do you know that? You know, you don't look dead. Maybe I'm like this fellow's question, I'm dead and not dead at the same time. But anyway, the way I know that is I've, I've been there many times that I remember, but I have, I have gone with people who've gone through the process. So you can go with people when they die. Okay, you just tag along with them. Your awareness, you know, in, in a, you, get, you can call it an out-of-body state, but that's just a, just a name we give to not being here. And you're there with them and you go through the process with them. That's an easy thing to do and you can do that too once you learn to get the noise out of your mind. So you can do that dozens of times with people and you'll, under, you'll eventually see the, the pattern and the process that takes place. Secondly, I had a job there for a while. Uh, I worked in transition, virtual reality. So I was one of those guys that said, oh, come on over, it's okay, you know, here, meet Uncle Fred and Aunt Sally. I had a, you know, I was like a Walmart greeter, <laughs> you know. Um, I did that sort of thing and, and uh, was part of the in-processing and part of the counseling and that sort of thing. So I had a job. And that job was given to me just so I would ha be able to have the experience of how that works. And I guess you could get jobs like that too. If uh, you, know, you were to a point where that was helpful in your growth and you get the consciousness system to plug you into that, uh, to that thing. So I worked there for a while and I've seen hundreds and hundreds of people process through. So that's where I get the information from. It comes out of my direct experience in the larger consciousness system. So that's the, that's the story. And uh, I guess we've come a long way, I guess from fear versus love, but that was a good question. Thanks uh, for told that. Everybody.